Well, welcome back to Talking with Tad. I mean, it is hard to believe there is less than 45 days to election, November 3rd, and then we have to look at when does early voting start? October 13th. That's a Tuesday this time, and it is right upon us. But you know what is really fabulous is to be able to have an opportunity to meet our candidates. And that's what's important. Let's understand who they are. Let's be able to share with people across our neighborhoods, in our districts. And the new challenge I hear that Chairwoman Ronna McDaniel has out, which I love, is that meet five new people and have a conversation with them. Now you're gonna have an opportunity to meet someone today. You might know him, but you're gonna to get to know him better or if you haven't, you're going to be able to be excited to get to know him. And today we are so lucky to have Judge David Newell with us and somebody that wants to share his story that reached out and I'm so excited he was yes to be able to be on talking with Tad. Now, Judge, I'm really excited to turn this over to you. I mean, I wanna know, we want to know about you, tell us, when did it hit you to become an attorney and to then fall into becoming a judge? I want to hear that story right from you. Okay. Thank you so much. And thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk a little bit about myself. My court is one that most people don't really know exists. And so me having these kinds of opportunities to reach out, especially in, a, in the environment we're in where we can't get out as much as we like is a real benefit to me. And I really appreciate you taking time on your busy schedule to meet with me. As far as what led me to become a lawyer and then a judge, I would like to let you know that my background has always been a, in writing. I always wanted to be a writer and I went to college for that purpose to get a degree in English. And, but halfway through or cl close to the end of my, my college career, a, a good friend of mine was sexually assaulted and I didn't really know how to help her. I wanted to help her. I wanted to know how to talk to her. I wanted to, I wanted to be there for her and I didn't know what to do. So I volunteered at the Houston Area Women's Center and answered the rape crisis hotline. And there, uh, I, I listened to a lot of different women in crisis and I realized I really wasn't going to be much help to as much of a help as I would have liked to been just doing English. So I actually changed my, my goals and became a lawyer. I went to the University of Texas School of Law to become a prosecutor. And that's what I did. And, and uh, when I went to the, uh, when I went to Fort, I went, I went to the University of Texas School of Law and then I came back home. I was, I grew up in Fort Bend County, Texas. And that's where I went to be an assistant district attorney. And from there, I was able to use my writing skill as an appellate prosecutor, as well as doing trials and things of that nature. And I did that. I was a prosecutor doing appeals, uh, particularly for about 17 years, oh. until there was an open spot on, uh, there were three open spots actually, on the Court of Criminal Appeals, which is the highest court in Texas for criminal cases. And I, having done the work and having lectured extensively on significant issues from the Court of Criminal Appeals and the United States Supreme Court, for lawyers all over the state for over a decade, I knew how important it was to have good quality judges that interpret the law as it's written, interpret the constitution according to its original meaning. And I wanted to make sure that we had a good judge up there on the court. And so I threw my name in the hat so that I could make sure that I could help so that I could actually serve the citizens of Texas. Well, you know, that th that is so important to be able to to look at the law, not to change it, but to to do what you're what you are doing. And the court that you're on, I think some people sometimes aren't sure between the Supreme Court, Texas Supreme Court, the Criminal Court of Appeals. But before we get into that aspect, I want to know, I mean, how much time well, right now, I don't know if you get to spend that much time in Austin. Are you able to spend time there or do you get, where, how's your life work before we get into the differences of the court? That's very, it's interesting you say that because I've been doing this job for, um, you know, I am your judge, your incumbent uh, judge on the Court of Criminal Appeals. And I was elected in 2014. I started serving in 2015. I really only got one day off, actually. That's exactly all I got. And I went there and I got a relatively sketchy apartment in Austin for a good price, but, uh, but it, it's, you know, not, not terribly, not terribly safe. And uh, I would stay there for part of the week. And the way I like to break it down is, is that I have a home in Missouri City, which is, I grew up in Sugar Land, but my wife grew up in Missouri City. And so we live in Missouri City. And so I spent about a third of my time, I would spend about a third of my time in Austin. 
and about a third of my time in Missouri City, and then a third of my time in my car. And uh, Haruska is between Austin and uh, Houston is a frequent stop there for me. But um, I did get to spend a lot of time there. We had thought about possibly my wife moving up with us, but I, I got to be honest, within about three or four months of, of me being sworn in, we were struck with a uh, tragedy. My wife's father passed away. Oh. And we wanted to make sure that she and my family and my kids could stay close to her mom. And so that's why we have maintained our residence in, in Missouri City so that we could be there for her when she needed us. She, she worked through her grief and then of course learned to live her new life as, as a widow. So. Well, you know, there's no question family is so important and I love hearing that that is a high priority in your life too. I mean, we've got to make that a part of all of our lives and, and put our priorities in the right direction. Well, and that's, that is quite interesting. I got to ask you this other question. What do you, do you listen to anything as you're driving? Are you on the phone? Exactly. I hope you're not texting while you're driving, but um, because that would get you in trouble. You might be in your own court. We wouldn't. Oh <laughs> Yeah, I, I do about, listen to. What do you to, do I, when you're in? You know, that's a lot. A third of your life in the car. What do you do? Well, I, I got to be honest. I, I do listen to a lot of audiobooks. Um, I listen. To, I'm generally a big fan of Harry Bosch and detective novels and things like that. Yeah. I guess that's not surprising given my line of work. Yeah. But I listen to that. But I do spend a lot of time also on the phone with my staff and things like. And I very much is like the Lincoln lawyer written by Michael Connelly, which is- Right, I've, been, I've seen, I love that movie. It is a great movie. I don't have quite have Matt McConaughey's looks or accent or anything like that. But, I, and I don't even drive a Lincoln, but it's just like Lincoln Lawyer. Um, but yeah, I, I do a lot of talking like that because a lot of times when I'm trying to keep up with the court's schedule and the, the Court of Criminal Appeals, most people don't realize is the busiest court of last resort in the country. We handle anywhere from six to 10,000 cases a year spread out among nine judges. And so we're constantly meeting. We don't have one meeting for the court a month. We meet every Monday in order to discuss the opinions that are going to come out on Wednesday. And then on Thursday, we have to pre-vote for the stuff we're going to talk about on the following Monday on Thursday. And then on Friday, we're actually writing up side opinions and things like that to add to our discussion on Monday. So I spent a lot of time talking with my staff about, I have two attorneys, a, briefing, a clerk from the law school and or just out of law school, and a staff attorney, and we well, this opinion needs to say X. This is what we wrote. We need to try to get to say this. Uh, those kinds of things. Um, but yeah, it's a 24/7 job given the, the amount of cases we handle. Um, you know, to put in perspective, the four, there are 14 courts of appeals who do incredible work. They're very, very busy. There's 14 courts of appeals in Texas in 14 different districts spread, and so the work they do is spread out among 80 judges, and and in a given year. All of those judges combined will do about 10,000 cases and issue so many opinions. And so we're doing a similar volume, but with only nine of us. So, so it's, it's, a, it's a very, very challenging job and we work very, very hard, so. Wow, it's, I, I didn't realize that that was the case. That is, that is incredible, the number of hours that you put in. And, and I really thank you for doing that. I mean, you're right, you do have a servant's heart and that is, that is just, that's incredible. Um, and in, in, is there any part of law that you, you kind of gravitate to more than others? Or, I mean, is all of it really interesting? Is, is there anything special like that you want to share? Sure. Uh, like I, a lot of people ask, well, what are the cases you find really significant? And I'm very fond of Fourth Amendment law because that's going to be your search and seizure area where that's gonna define how police officers can interact with the citizenry. And I, so a lot of those cases are very, very important to me. And I'm very well versed in those areas, particularly when you get into new technology and how new technology affects the analysis that you do under the constitution. Uh, I find that very fascinating. So I definitely am very interested in that. And then on the other side though, from the, from, uh, I'm also very interested in, you know, a lot of people see uh, cases or documentaries about wrongful convictions. Texas is actually a, a leader in addressing those problems with what makes convictions bad because sometimes they're based on junk science or or uh, some information was never turned over and i've written a number of significant cases on my court granting actual innocence relief because texas is uniquely suited to be able to take the lead in these kinds of things so we make sure that those who are are deserve to be prosecuted are prosecuted fairly and efficiently but those who should never have been brought in the system are given the relief that they need so 
those are the two big areas I think that I would I would say that I really focus on. Well, that's that's quite interesting. Um, I you know I we've been hearing a lot about that with the law and order and how people have gotten into this. Um, Alice was is wasn't that who President Trump uh, just pardoned? Uh, actually, got her out of prison and then right. she just pardon her. So that I think it's really, it, I think you, that is a focus that I'm glad that you have brought up. I think right now too, law and order is just so crucial in the whole, in our whole being. I mean, of what's going on across this nation. And I mean, I would imagine you have a lot of conversations about, uh, about what's happening right now. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the, you know, obviously, there's a lot of different facets to these things, and these are the kinds of things that come before my court. So I, I don't want to get into specifics about sort of feelings about different aspects of things. But I mean, I am a prosecutor for 17 years. I, 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 I train police officers at the Gus George Academy, so I, I do understand their perspective. But I've also learned to try and understand the perspective of the folks that are, are, are uh, protesting. And, and I, I certainly support everyone's First Amendment right to protest, but I don't agree with when it comes to the violent protests or, or um, breaking the law and things like that, I don't agree with those things, obviously, because that's against the law. Um, but we've had a, many conversations just in our family about how, what this means for our country with our sons uh, to try and say, look, this is, this is what these arguments are. These are what you're hearing from different people. And, and as I was saying, actually, off camera, it's really, I've taken this time to really just reemphasize sort of the golden rule, which is I try to tell my kids, I try myself to, to let these kinds of things not get to me. I try to assume the best of people. I try to not attribute bad motives to them. And if someone gets angry with me because they're stressed or frustrated or whatever, I try to let it roll off my back. I try to turn the other cheek because, you know, there are times when I'm stressed and maybe I'm not the best person to other people. So I've tried to use that to really focus on trying to be just that kind of a person. And, uh, and that's really the message we've really conveyed to my, my, my sons. And, and uh, so that's, those are some of the thoughts we've had given everything that's been going on. Well, I, you know, I love that because I agree with, I agree with you 100%. There are different perspectives and we have to sit down, talk about it, get around the table and listen. We don't, I am all for protests, all for, you know, I did it, I still do it. And, but I want it done peacefully. We don't need these people, the agitators that get in there but you know, to have an opportunity to figure out how do we fix this up. So, I mean, you have really, truly shared a real good perspective in many different areas. And I'm just so impressed that we've had this time to have this conversation. But you know, there's one last part that you have to share. And that's <laughs> a fun fact. We always end talking with Tad with a fun fact with our uh, speaker of the day or our interviewee. So, what is your fun fact that you're going to share? And ladies and gentlemen, I haven't heard this one yet, so I'm going to be just as surprised. <laughs> well, I appreciate it. Yeah, I don't know that how fun my fact is, but I can tell you this, you know, as big as my writing career is, the, uh, my first big writing accomplishment was I won a contest for writing a haiku poem about food. And uh, the, the poem goes like this. I can repeat to you quickly. Table salt knows not the shame of overlooked spice like crushed red pepper. That was apparently enough to get me a free dinner in Houston. <laughs> I, I'm very proud of that. I have since published other things, but that was really, that was my launching pad. Food haiku, food poetry was me. Food poetry, but you know what? You're still being able to be, in a, you can be an attorney, but you still get to use your English major uh, and right. write and share with people. Oh, that is awesome. Judge, you have been such an incredible person to talk to and get to know. I know we're going to be out there supporting you going down the ballot because we've got to go all the way down the ballot. I don't think you're right. as far down as some, but we've got to be there to vote for you and we will be promoting you. And thank you so much for taking this time today. Thank you so much for having me. I, I really, really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you all for joining us with Talking with Tad.